Christine, would you pray? Amen. Yes, so choices. Uh, in America, we are certainly enamored with the freedom we have to make choices. No one is going to tell us what to do, we say to ourselves. And if our real retail stores are any indication, the more cho choices we have, the better it would appear. And as one person said, we may be free to make choices, but we, but we are not free whether or not we suffer the consequences of our decisions. We may be free to make choices, but we are not free whether or not we suffer the consequences of our decisions. And yet, every decision comes with a consequence, comes with the results that happen in our lives, and oftentimes, where we find ourselves today is based on the choices that we have made yesterday, just elevating the importance of choices. Well, hopefully, you will understand that God cares a lot about choices as well. He's the one who came up with the idea of free will in the first place, after all. And yet the choices he presents at times are far more stark than the cereal aisle at the grocery store. I set before you life and death, he says, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you may live. Now there are many choices under the umbrella of choosing life or choosing death, choosing blessing or choosing cursing. You know, I'm not to say, I'm not saying by any means that there aren't neutral part of our lives, you know, when we do housework or go to work or cut the grass or fix our cars or play golf or whatever. There's nothing inherently good or evil in those. And yet, whether we're pursuing those things under the context of the Spirit, under the context of God's will, or whether we're pursuing them to those things based in flesh, based in our desire and what we're trying to accomplish, that's more of what the Bible is talking about. So before we make those little decisions about the various circumstances and situations of life, I think what the Bible oftentimes is saying is we have to set our course in terms of, again, what are we choosing in terms of life or death? Are we choosing blessing or cursing? You know, I like what Mike had to share in terms of, you know, God caring about our intention. But we do have to understand it, it never ends there. You know, if we really were to look at, you know, the course of process when it comes to behavior, then it would probably start with knowledge. We, we know something. Then there's a conviction about that knowledge. This is important. I need to do something about that. Then there's intention that says, okay, now I'm going to do something. But then intention has to result in choice. If we don't ultimately then make a different decision, uh, you know, exhibit a different behavior, a different thought, a different speech, again, it really doesn't matter what we intended, that it has to result in uh, the, the behavior. But again, setting our, our, our markers in terms of just what we're oriented to. And naturally, uh, uh, I say all this and introduce the sermon in this way because really that's what Paul has been uh, using He's been using that same language when we've been going through Romans chapter 8. And as you know, we've been in the book of Romans for quite a long time. We've been in Romans 8 quite a long time in and of itself. Very powerful portion of scripture. And yet again, we see in terms of the way Paul is expressing just how are we orienting our lives? What are we thinking about? What are we engaging with? Again, are we looking to be people of spirit or people of flesh? Are we thereby fostering our lives in our lives, life or death? And really what I believe about what Paul is doing, I mean, outside of jumping out of the page and smacking, up, smacking us upside the head in terms of helping us see what he's saying, he is passionately presenting reasons why, should we, why should we should make good choices, why we should follow God. Why we should be open to the power and influence that God places in our lives as believers. So he is, in many ways, encouraging good choices. Encouraging choices about God's will, about God's knowledge, about our relationship with us. The first thing that we saw that he really talked about is our identity in Christ. The fact that when we believe on Jesus Christ, we are in a relationship with God. That we are now identified with him. What the Bible tells us, as we believe in Jesus Christ, that we are actually in Christ, and Christ is in us. Now, naturally, we know uh, that to be a believer in Jesus Christ, we have to understand the whole purpose for which Jesus came to this earth, 
That basically Jesus came to this earth, lived his life, uh, showed us just who God was, showed us the kind of things God would do, showed us the kind of things God would say, but kind of in a real radical twist of just what his purpose was, all of a sudden this great miracle-working, teaching, good guy gets crucified on a cross. And we might say, well, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Naturally, it never could happen outside of God's intent, outside of Jesus' will that man could nail him to a cross. And so therefore what the Bible reveals is a purpose that he was nailed to the cross is that he could bear in his body the sins that we have committed, the wrong that we have done. And then by virtue of his death and him paying the penalty for our sins, now what the rest of Scripture calls us to is to believe in him, to accept the fact that when he died, he was dying for me, that the way that I become right with God is by virtue of the death that Jesus died on the cross. And so that's, that's, the, that's the story behind Romans 8 in terms of all that Paul is encouraging in terms of good decisions. Because for Paul, good decisions are not about behavior modification. We always have to remember that. When we see the Bible telling us, do this, don't do this, love your neighbor, be kind, be compassionate, you know, love your wives, you know, respect your husbands, all the things that the Bible would encourage us to do, it's, it's never about behavior modification. It's never about gritting our teeth and let's see what I can do in my flesh with my ability to try and get things done. It's always about tapping into a spiritual power, a spiritual influence, you know, based in a relationship with God that's based in the sacrifice of Christ. And so as we engage in what Paul is um, explaining here and encouraging us, again, to make good choices, again, that identity in Christ, the fact that we are Christ and Christ is ours, we are in Him and He is in, his, in us, that is only true of those who have believed on Jesus Christ, who have come to Him to, to make Him their Savior, to, to recognize their need that they could never be right before God outside of the provision of Christ. It couldn't be good enough. I couldn't give enough as much m money as would be needed. I couldn't help enough old ladies across the streets. You know, there's no good works that I could do to make myself right with God. And so that's why God took care of that by sending His Son and having him sacrificed on the cross. But, again, in terms of the encouragement that Paul has been given, again, it's about, it's about choose the Spirit, choose life because you're identified with Christ. He's also talked about power and ability. He's talked about the fact that God has empowered us through his Spirit to do, do right things, to make right choices, to follow God, to live in the Spirit rather than living in the flesh. Now, last week in Romans chapter 8, verse 12, where we are currently, so if you can turn your Bibles, or we'll be in the screen, up in the screen in a moment. In a screen in a moment. Um, it says, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. And so therefore, this is just another thing that Paul is putting before us in terms of why should we follow God? Why should we make right choices? Why should we orient ourselves to the spirits and to God and His person and our relationship with Him in terms of then moving in our life and the things we would then eventually do. Why should we do that? Because we have an obligation. Now, one thing that I didn't mention last week is that verse 12 starts with a therefore. And for anyone that has been studying the Bible for any length of time, when we see a therefore, what question do we need to ask? Therefore. What is it there for? Whenever you see a therefore, we have to ask, what is it there for? And so basically what it always does is it points us to look back in terms of, okay, Paul has proposed all these things. He's said all this truth. Now, therefore, this is the case. Now, basically, it would be fair for us to rethink and reread verses 1 through 11. Because I do believe, I mean, we're not going to do that because we're going to do it enough. But anyways, um, uh, but, but when you think about this, therefore, he would be talking about all the things that God has done. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. We are, you know, sealed by the Spirit and blessed by Him and empowered by all these different things. But if we just look at verse 11 as a reason why that therefore is there, 
Um, just read what we have here in verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So and if the spirit of him who, who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And so basically what verse 11 is telling us is, again, this is, this is the basis of the obligation. I mean, along with the other things he said in verses 111, but just think about all that that verse expresses. Think about what kind of power was involved in raising Jesus from the dead. You know, we think about death and we think about the finality of that, the, 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 the fact that it is something that we, it's, all, it's waiting for all of us, it will happen someday, and it is normally the end. That once someone dies, that's it, they go on over, but not for Jesus, that he was raised from the dead. In fact, the only reason why Jesus' death on the cross could be powerful, that it could be a solution to our lives, is the fact that he was raised. But what Paul says in verse 11 is because of our identification with Christ, because of our belief in Christ, that power that God, gave, that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is in our lives. That he, that's the thing that gives us victory over our mortal bodies. You know, one thing I've talked about, particularly from Romans chapter 7, I think one thing that troubles even the human heart outside of Christ is, what do I do with my evil inclinations? You know, sometimes how bad people are is shocking to them. We should be shocked at times about how bad we are. You know, the insidious ways we want to hurt people, or put people down, or, or, or do wrong things, or satisfy wrong desires. And it's like, where did this come from? I'm really ashamed of that. I'm not going to tell my mother I did that. I'm not going to put that on my Facebook page. You know, there's a lot of stuff that, again, well, boy, if, if, if people knew who I really was, uh, and, and, and so... What God has said, what Paul is saying here is that when it comes to that nature, when it comes to, again, that insidious part of us that is evil in nature, God comes in with his spirit, with the power that gave Christ life in his death, and that's inside us. And so along with all the other things that Paul has said in verses 1 through 11, that creates an obligation. That, that, that um, presents... A, a, a response from us. It's a requirement. It's something that would indebt us to say, okay, because God has done this, now I'm obligated to do something about that. And yet, as I said last week, Paul doesn't start with the positive. Our obligation is to, to God. I think that's assumed. But he says, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. Now, why do you think Paul says that? Why do you think Paul, after talking about an obligation, just says, it's not to the sin nature? I think it's because we are very tempted to make it about the sin nature. Like, Paul doesn't have to talk about our obligation to God, because if, if, if that's the, what we internalize, is that, if that's what we understand, and our response to all that he said is, hey, I understand my obligation to God. Again, we don't need instruction for that. We don't need to be commanded. Make sure you're all... But we do need to be commanded about it's not to the sinful nature. Because oftentimes what is working in our lives, oftentimes the things that we are operating on is by virtue of that nature. And yet don't be deceived. Don't, don't, you know, basically, certainly that's what your sin nature is going to tell you. Your sin nature is going to talk about what it offers you. The sin nature is going to tell you about um, the obligation you have. You know, you, you, you're, you're this far, you can't get away. I mean, certainly that's the voice that's in an addict. That you, 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 can't, you can't free yourself from this. You can't stop this. And that's a lie. You're obligated to me. You know, I was told, you know, I've dealt with a lot of people dealing with addictions and one alcoholic that had been in recovery for a while, what he said was, you know, when I really think about it, in me choosing against alcohol, 
I was really getting rid of my best friend. That that's what the alcohol had deceived him in, in terms of, you need me. You are obligated to me. You can't get by without me. I mean, those are the kind of messages that come from the sin nature, and that's a very reason why Paul says, but when, when the sin nature is communicating to you about obligation, realize you don't have an obligation to that. You have an obligation to God. Amen. And so again, another reason why we would, uh, again, be motivated to make right decisions, be motivated to do the things that God would have to do, and maybe even more so, more than doing the things God would have to do, is to be the people that God wants us to be. Amen. Now, this, you know, God always, always starts with being as opposed to doing. Like, you do what you are. If you are a good tree, you bear good fruit, so, to show, so work to be a good tree. Grow in the capacity and knowledge that God has you to grow in, and then the fruit that will come from that and so, uh, that, that God is about both being and doing, uh, but he would start with what, what's going on inside us, motivating those decisions. And that's why I said these categories are pretty stark in terms of what he's directing. And so therefore, brothers, we have, not, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And so you see that stark contrast. Do you see that you know the, the, the stark decision, the stark choice? It's, it's life or death. It's reminiscent of Deuteronomy. It's reminiscent of Joshua leading the people into the promised land and saying, "I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Cursing, choose life so you might live." You know, so in the same spirit, Paul sees the same dynamic happening in the human heart. Like, are you making choices based in the spirit, based in the influence of God, or are you basing your, your decision according to the flesh, according to the sin nature, according to that evil influence that's there? Maybe another thing that I need to talk about in terms of this evil nature is we have to understand that oftentimes when we think about evil, we think about sin, we think about external things. We think about the horrible things. We think about murder and stealing and, you know, uh, beating people up or you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Like all those, like not me, but what about jealousy? Yep. What about covetousness? What about gossiping? Well, what, what about, I guess we saw before, a couple of weeks ago, not just not doing the negative things, but not doing the positive things. And then not really being available to God, not really seeking Him. See, again, in our lives, we are either establishing ourselves in the Spirit, in the character and nature of God, in the counsel of His Word, being the people that God wants us to be, or we're making it on our own. It's one or the other. And, and, it's, it, it, and God is not sharing. Like God, God is not going to mix you and Him in terms of accepting what you bring to the table. I mean, we, we bring our will, we bring faith, you know, we, we have to make the choice, we, we are the ones that God is never going to make us do something, but then once we choose and we orient ourselves to God, then God says, I'm going to provide the power, I'm going to provide the transformation, I'm going to provide the renewal. You just have to be open to it, you need to believe it, you need to grow in it, you need to engage in it. And so therefore, when, the, when, when Paul makes this stark contrast to the choices, again, for you live according to the sinful nature, you will die, but if the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now Paul is talking to believers here. So therefore, the death that he's talking about cannot be the second death. I mean, that is not the death that separates us from God for eternity. All right, when the Bible uses the word death, death can mean different things. Uh, certainly, we would most automatically refer to physical death. You know, the fact that when our physical body stops working and our brain stopped functioning and now we're dead. But what the Bible says is that after that physical death, we will all then stand before God and the book shall be opened. And for all those people that are found in the book of life, they will enter heaven 
And those that are not found in the book of life will go into the eternal lake of fire. And so that is the second death. That, that, that is the death that is consistent with the sin nature, but that's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul is talking about, again, the, the natural and inherent aspect that flows from the sin nature. That, again, when we operate independent of God, again, that independence of God doesn't mean we're mean people. It doesn't mean we're going around and being selfish and prideful and so on and so forth. I mean, there'll be a part of that in all of us, I think. But... It just means you're living life independent of God. That you're saying to God, I don't need you, I don't want you, I'm just going to do things on my own. That is, that is the flesh. That, that, that is the pride that comes from thinking that you don't need to engage with God to be the person that God wants you to be. And let me just say this, is that when it comes to the kingdom of darkness, when it comes to the, the kingdom that Satan has orchestrated, that basically... He'll let you do anything that's independent from God. So therefore, if you're, if, if you're thinking in terms of, hey, why do I need God? I'm a pretty good person on my own. I'm kind to my neighbor. I love my wife. I take care of my kids. You know, so what do I need God for? Well, because God never intended for us to live independent from him. And so therefore, the kingdom of darkness will just let you Continue to do anything you want independent of God as long as you remain independent from God. You want to see how active Satan is and the sin nature is in your life? Try to follow God. Try to be in His Word. Try to pray. Try to come to church consistently. Try to intend in terms of your life to fulfill a godly purpose oriented to the Word, convicted and empowered by Him, and then all of a sudden you'll see who Satan is. All of a sudden, you'll see who the sin nature is. Because all the, all the powers and influence of hell is coming against you to stop doing that. And so you just, we just have to understand that, that, that there, is a, there is a place of independence from God that doesn't seem particularly bad. Or again, I'm not living to the sin nature. I'm not promoting death in my life. Well, you know, if you're independent from God and you're oriented to that nature, just an inherent part of that nature is death. You know, you eat chocolate cake every night, and for, for a time, it's going to be fine. doesn't seem like it's hurting me, but all of a sudden, 20 years later, after a piece of chocolate cake every night, okay, the weight, the waist, the heart, the cholesterol, blah, blah, blah. Now, all of a sudden, you see, that cake seemed very innocent at the time, but now, all of a sudden, there was, and that's, that's kind of what, it, what Paul is talking about, that when we give ourselves to sin nature, the, the influence that it encourages is, is death. And on the other side, naturally, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live once again. That is not live forever. We will eventually die physically. Um, but it is it, it's, it's talking about the nature of life that we have. And it's talking about the, the inherent part of what the Spirit promotes in our life because of that. Now, I like I like. The, the, the phrase here, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body. Yeah. I, I like to put to death the misdeeds of the body. You know, because in many ways, that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's when we talk about choices, when we talk about God's will and our will, when we talk about doing things for God and promoting righteousness and promoting truth and doing what, you know, the power of us for all the things that God would do. And then that part of us that doesn't want to do that, that part of that that actually encourages pretty evil, insidious things, or again, whatever opportunity it has to make us pride, prideful or selfish or put someone else down or be jealous or envious or whatever, that that, that nature is, is what's being addressed here. But what I find interesting is that when the Bible talks about it, it always talks about it in the context of death. Like it doesn't say, by the, by the, by the Spirit, because those who are led by the Spirit, um, let me see, let me see. I'm, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, for if you live according to the simple nature of that, if by the Spirit you put to, you, you, you negotiate the misdeeds of the body, you will live. It doesn't say that, right? If, if, if by the Spirit you rationalize the misdeeds of the body, it doesn't say that, right? 
Does, it doesn't say, uh, if by the Spirit you condone the misdeeds of the body. I mean, all those words, rationalize, condone, justify, uh, those are the words we like to use with sin, right? Like when, when, when we're talking about the misdeeds we do, the insidious part of our nature, we, we rationalize, oh, well, I did this because of her, or I did it because of him, and I'm acting this way because they hurt me, or whatever, I'm going to get them back. All these different things we do that we rationalize and condone our sin nature, and yet what does the Bible say? No, it, it has to be put to death. Death is the only thing, the only fitting way to talk about that nature that would ultimately influence us, influence us outside of God is to, is to kill it. And, and, and so therefore, it's by the Spirit you put it to death, the misdeeds of the body. By death, uh, to make, make sure your tongue is talking the way it's supposed to talk. And, and by the Spirit, make sure your mind is thinking the way it, 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 you should be thinking. And so again, that's so, so, so I want to point out the fact that it says by death you do that, that that's a word that it uses to associate with the misdeeds of our body, but it's also by the Spirit. That God never says, put to death the things of the body, but I got nothing for you on the other side. That it's always put to death by the Spirit because on the other side, I've got better alternatives. I've got a better way. I've got greater power. I have better transformation in terms of what I'm leading you to. And so therefore, it's not only putting to death one thing, it's giving life to what God has for us. And that's the, that's the beauty of that in terms of what Paul is describing in verse 13. But then, again, that all flows from the obligation piece. Again, we're, we're talking about all the things that Paul gives, all the things that Paul is telling us. Wh why do you make good choices? Make good choices because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been identified with Christ. If, you, if you're a believer in Christ, you have the power of the Spirit inside you. If you're a believer in Christ, you have to recognize you have an obligation to God. And it's not to the sin nature, it's to the Spirit, so follow the Spirit. And then the fourth thing that is here is about the relationship we have with God and the fact that we are part of His family. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. If you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. That heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, indeed we share, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So don't miss again, for you do not receive for, for because those who are led, I'm sorry, verse 14, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Amen. Children of God. Amen. We're part of his family. See, when all of a sudden we make the choice to say, you know something? I don't want to encourage spirits. I want to encourage godliness. I want to follow God's way. All of a sudden, as the, again, we connect to Christ and the cross and salvation, and then the power of Christ is flowing through us. It's revealing to us whose family we're part of. Yeah. And the fact that we are part of God's family. The fact that we are children of God. And what that, what that reveals and what that leads us to in terms of all the benefits that come from that all the awareness that is there. You know, we can, we can never overemphasize the importance of acceptance. When we think about just what is in our human hearts, the, 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 the fact that we, we yearn for acceptance, we desire acceptance. I mean, think about all the things you have done to be accepted by people. Think about the times in your life that you did something you wouldn't otherwise do, but you did it, to be accepted by people. Yeah. Think about times in your life that you've dressed a certain way. Not because you necessarily want to dress a certain way, but you did it to be accepted by people. You know, jokes you listen to, jokes you say, different things you do, again, for the sake of being accepted by people. You know, you think about even 
You know, you, 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 you hear the testimony of gang members and what gangs are looking out for, and they're looking for the disconnected and the people that don't have families, and then what the, the gang becomes their family. But now all of a sudden, because you're part of the gang, you've got to do this, you've got to run the drugs, you've got to kill the person, you've got to do the thing, because now we're family. Now, now, now you're doing things because you're connected to us. And so that need in our life for acceptance is something that we are yearning for. I mean, families are supposed to us are supposed to supply that on some level. That if we had a healthy upbringing, we should have a sense that we are acceptable, that we're able to be accepted. You know, sometimes the struggle of being accepted is people don't even think they're acceptable. Because the message that they receive from their families is that you're not worthy, you're not acceptable. And just realize that, again, in the economy of God, in the family of God, all those things are resolved. Because what God says is, come as you are. Amen. What God says is, I accept you, not because of who you are, but because of who Christ is. Amen. That our identification, again, this is for believers in Jesus, for those who... Um, have believed that again my identification and what makes me part of the family of God is not because of who I am but because of who Jesus is. Amen. But even when you think about the impulse that God had to send Jesus to the earth to die for us while we were yet sinners what is God seeing even there? Even as a sinner I wanted to accept you. Even as a sinner, I wanted you part of my family. Even as a sinner, I loved you enough to die for you. But you just have to understand that as God, I need you to become a certain thing to be part of my family. See, I love you enough. God's love is expressed in the sacrifice of Christ. But becoming part of his family to receive that love and the greater love that God would have... We have to be fixed. But God doesn't say, fix yourself. God says, come to Christ, believe on Him, and then I fix you. And then now, the same love that was reflected in the salvation I offered you, and ultimately accepting you just the way you are, not asking you to fix your love, yourself before you come to Christ, but come to Christ in faith, and then God makes you acceptable. God then provides his righteousness that now says, you are in my family. That you are part of the relationship. You can call me father. And so therefore, whatever you would have in terms of brokenness that you are not acceptable, God says, I accept you. Whatever you would have in terms of the need you have for acceptance, one of the, beauty, one of the beauties of um, being accepted by God is now how we engage with people. Now all those thoughts of, oh, I gotta look a certain way, I gotta talk a certain way, I'm gonna be with these people, so I gotta be like this, and all that stuff goes away. I mean, that's pressure. That's fear. That that's like I gotta put on a certain face, I gotta be a certain person that I otherwise wouldn't want. What? What God? No, just just perfect. I mean, what what uh, yeah. There's never enough time. Um, I mean, because be, for you, because be, I mean, doesn't it make sense? And he goes from after you again. You're sons of God, for for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. That that basically what that fear has to do with in this context is that fear of rejection. I mean, you know how much angst is in people's hearts about what if God doesn't accept me? Well, what if I'm not right with God? What if I don't have enough to get to Him? I mean, that is the, that is the slavery of the law. Like, you, 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 you try to make yourself right. You try to do all the things that are required. You help as many people as you can. You're as kind as you can. So on and so forth. But you never know if it's enough. That part of what God tried to resolve in bringing Jesus to the earth and saying, just believe, just to accept the sacrifice I made, is he wants to take away that fear that once you believe in Christ, 
You have the acceptable means, you have the acceptable sacrifice, and now you don't have to have, you don't have to live in that fear. You don't have to live in that fear of rejection. You don't have to live in that fear of, well, what if God doesn't want me, or God wouldn't take me, or if I could live good. No, that's not even, that's not even the question you should be, you should be asking. The question you should be asking is, who is Jesus? And what, what, what truth and validity is there in terms of what he said about himself, what he accomplished on the cross, and him being the means, him being the way to God? And what comes along with that, though, as we believe in Jesus, again, it's a spirit that reinforces this sonship, reinforces this family connection. I mean, even this term that is here, the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. That word, Abba, is this close, intimate relationship that God desires from us, where it's more like it's Daddy. Now, Daddy, I need a hug. Daddy, I need affirmation. Daddy, I need some instruction. God, I, Daddy, I need wisdom. I don't know what to do. I'm in a tight spot. And God says, yeah, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. Perfect love drives out fear. That now your access to God is unfettered in terms of him, you coming before him and him accepting you, again, because of Jesus Christ. You know, we shouldn't be surprised that God would require us to be a certain way in, in terms of being with him, but to know that he provided the way. Like, he's not asking us to be something except to believe in Jesus. And then once we do that, again, then we're, we're translated into this context where, again, we're receiving this power. We have this obligation, but that obligation is transformed by relationship. It's transformed by the fact that we're doing this because we want to, not because we have to. But we'll get to more of this uh, next week. So let's bow and let's pray. Uh, Father, we do uh, thank you for, for all the things you do provide for us. So all the things you make possible for our lives, the transformation, the renewal, to become the very people that you have created us to be. And so, Father, I do pray for anyone here uh, that is outside of that relationship, that, that they've never come to a point where they believed on Jesus as their Savior. And so, Father, I just pray for them uh, that in the heart of hearts right now, they would sense you drawing on them, and that we would respond to that call by saying, Yes, God, I believe. Yes, God, I trust. I accept Jesus and the death that he died to be the payment for my sin. And I stand before you, purified by his blood and by his sacrifice. And so, Father, we thank you for that sacrifice. And thank you for anyone that has come to that conclusion this morning, that conviction in terms of just who Jesus is. And, Father, we just know that that is not an end but a beginning in terms of the new life that God has for them. And so, Father, I just pray for anyone who has... Enter your family this morning. Just pray you continue to build them up and encourage them in faith. Father, for those still struggling and wondering, eh, I'm not sure that I buy this, I just pray that you would continue to reveal yourself, continue to move and, and, and convict in terms of the need they have for Christ and for his sacrifice. And so, Father, for us who are believers, I just pray that we would just continue to revel in the relationship we have with you that still has with it an obligation in terms of what you would call us to be in, in, in receiving all the things that you have for us and being the people that you desire for us to be. And so, Father, we lift all these things before you in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus.